Okay. So, all right, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to 180. I'm Pastor Lee. I'm glad that you guys are here. Yes, each one of you individually. I love you. I would name you all, but I don't know your names. Um, actually, I do. Half of you, probably. Actually, the majority. So, what have we been, you guys know what we've been going through for the last couple weeks? We've been going through truth, that's right. Truth was the first week. What was the second week? Anybody know? It was God exists. Uh, so truth is, truth is absolute. Uh, Brandon, where's you, where are you at, Brandon? Brandon D-Lap. Did that dude bounce? What a, what a tool. He does that. What a weirdo. Um, I don't know why he does that. He knows that I talk about him in my teachings. Um, anyway, okay. So truth is absolute. Okay, the second one was what? Can, can we put that up, actually? Do you have that? Okay, God exists. This, the third one is miracles are possible. Then we talked about last week, the New Testament is historically reliable. So what's next? Hey, that's right. That's correct. All right. And then number six is Jesus claimed to be God and is confirmed by Scripture. Okay. So if the New Testament is historically reliable, truth is absolute, uh, that we can trust Scripture and therefore what Scripture says um, is, is, is truth. So um, get this. Are you ready? This is what happened. I was typing up my notes on my laptop and I drove all the way to my brother's house in King. Do you guys know where King is? King, North Carolina? Okay. Okay, well he lives in King, so my little nephew is playing uh, Smash Brothers on Super, uh, or uh, N64. You guys know Smash Brothers? Okay, so he's playing, actually it's not like this, it's like this, <laughs> with the N64. So, he's playing Super Smash Brothers and he cannot beat the target level with Yoshi. So my brother, who is older than me, he says, man, Uncle Lee, he can do it. If there's anybody that can do it, he can do it. So I went over, and Logan's like, little Logan, he's like, you know, can you beat this for me? And I'm like, yeah, I can beat it for you, man. So I played a little bit, I couldn't beat it. Um, it was humiliating, so I ended up taking the game and playing it and continuing to play it. So finally, I beat it and I was able to take it back. Well, the game was in my computer bag, and I left my computer bag in King with my notes there, so what you guys have is kind of a quickly put together notes, okay, from me. I had better notes than this, but I think this will do if you guys will just follow me. It's actually one of my favorite things to talk about is this subject, because whenever I was your age, I gave my life to the Lord, and I'm a unplug this real quick. I just don't like to hear myself on this side. Okay, so I gave my life to the Lord, and I started reading the Bible. I was really interested. It really intrigued me. I really loved learning about the Lord and, and everything, and pretty soon I found out that there are more people who use this Bible, but they use it for different purposes, and they have different versions of their Bibles. That's why we talked about the manuscripts that we have and how they come from the Greek manuscripts and how there's, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of them. Okay, and we can trust it and we can uh, translate it correctly and we can cross-check all the different versions and things like that. So there are some who will take the Word of God, those manuscripts, and pervert it. There are some who will use a different translation uh, that is not appropriate. Uh, you guys have probably had some of these folks knock on your door at some moment. You might see them riding around on a bike in a white, in a white suit um, or a white, you know, white shirt, tie. Those are called Mormons, right? Um, you know, uh, president or not president, but president nominee, I guess. Mitt Romney was a Mormon, right? So you see Mormons and also you see Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your door, right? These people, they all claim to have the Word of God, and they all, to some extent, do. The Mormons have the Bible. They, they use this that I have in my hands. But they also have some other scriptures, some other literature, like the Pearl of Great Price, which is what they use beside of the Bible. Now, when we open up that and we open up the Bible, 
we see that it doesn't really coincide and the Book of Mormon uh, or the Pearl of Great Price will say that basically it's Jesus plus works. Now we know because it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that it's by grace we're saved through faith that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not by anybody's works that we get into heaven. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So there's all of these other competing religions and even beliefs about who Jesus was. Remember whenever I was talking about uh, Pontius Pilate, who, what, who Jesus was sent before? And Pontius looks at Jesus and he says, what is truth? And, and he had a question of who Jesus was, like, who are you? And so there's a lot of people that say a lot of different things about Jesus. You'll hear um, people say that, you know, Jesus was a good prophet. If you ask Muslims, they'll say, oh yeah, Jesus was, was cool. He, he was a good prophet. We actually say a lot about Jesus in our writings. We, we respect Jesus. Um, you'll see that uh, some people say that he was a good teacher, that you should definitely look at his teachings, but you should definitely throw away all of the miraculous things that happened in Scripture that it says that he did. There's a lot of different people who have a lot of different beliefs, and you guys have probably been told that and brought up in a conversation with other people. So what I want to do is I want to clear all that smoke because really there's, if there's one thing that Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or, or anybody does, it's they get Jesus wrong. They get him incorrect. They get an incorrect view of him that's not scriptural, that's not based in the Word of God. So what I want to do is I want to show you what the Word of God says. Whenever I was your age, um, actually it was maybe like right whenever I was getting out of high school, what I was doing was I, uh, I went to an apartment complex with a bud of mine, and we are going to start like a Bible study there. It, you know, they, they ended up calling the, the place that we lived, it was called like Criminal Creek, uh, because the cops were always uh, in that place a lot, you know, for different things that were going on. Actually, the guys below us, they were pushing drugs, and uh, one time I had a, it was so funny, I had a sticker, I got one, I got one of those uh, police stickers from one of the, the policemen. And like I'm wearing it, and they like start freaking out. Like even like I'm here, and like the, I, I don't see these guys come out for a couple of days. And my next door neighbor, she like she, I don't know if like, like talk, they talk to her or what, but she comes over and she's like, "Hey, you know, are, are you, are you a cop? Are you an undercover cop or something?" Because I guess they thought that I had forgotten to take off my badge or something. But that's how bad this place was. Okay, so. I went there, and whenever I was there, I, I had an encounter with some, some religious people who came up. It was two women. Two women came up, and they started telling me the, the good news. And I could tell right off the bat that they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was, I was pretty studied up. I was like, okay, you guys, you didn't know it, but I've been studying. I've been reading. So, you know, I pull out their Bible. Uh, it's called the New World's Translation. And I, I have places highlighted where I'm like, all right, right here it says this. You know, it's a little different version. You know, like you'll see that they change some words in the New Testament. Every time you see the word kurios, which is Lord, they write, uh, it's a capital L-O-R-D, or no, it's just L-O-R-D. They write Jehovah, because that's what they say the Lord's name is, or Yahweh's name is, is Jehovah. So every time they see kurios, they change it to Jehovah. So when you see Lord in there, it's Jehovah for them. Well, I went to, to one where it says, um, where they actually, they, there's one part where they don't translate Lord as Jehovah. They translate it Lord. It's in Romans chapter 14, 7. I'm not going to go there. But it says basically this, that we all live to Jehovah. We all die to the Jehovah. We all have something to Jehovah. And then it says, for this reason, Jesus came to earth so that he could be both Jehovah you know, and, and I, I was like, what, what is it? Look, in the original Greek, this is what it says. And they're like, oh, da, ba, da, ba. So, so, they, so they got the men to come up. They're like, uh, can, can you wait one second? We're going to go get our, you know, our, our husbands. So they went and got their husbands. And I started talking to their husbands. Turns out that their husbands were a little bit smarter than they were. And I ended up just getting like an earful and really being kind of shaken at that moment because 
I really, I studied up, but I'd never been in a, in a situation like that where I had to defend my faith and point to them. So they were pretty well versed in, in, in their beliefs. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that you guys are well versed in your beliefs and know why you believe what you believe. Even when you're studied, guys, there's going to be people that come to you that are really smart and will have a lot of good objections. Your job is to hear those objections and look at what scripture actually says. You are a truth seeker. Luckily, we have the truth. Luckily, it's not hard to find. Luckily, you have a body of believers that want to help out with that too, okay? So this next part is that Jesus in the scriptures is God according to scripture. So what I wanted to do real quick, uh, we're gonna go through a couple of verses in small groups as well, but let me pray real quick before I open up another verse, okay? God, thank you for tonight. I pray that you bless these students. Bless this time. Uh, thank you for my notes being all the way in King and, and that I get to do this kind of from memory, or memory and then some of it from just what I've written down really quickly. I pray that you'd bless these guys and that they would grow in your word and that it, they would know how to defend what they believe. Lord, and know why they believe what they believe. And that this faith would become their own. Not the, not the faith of their pastor, not the faith of their parents, not the faith of their friends, but their faith. That they would see you tonight and encounter you tonight. A God who is very well alive and living, living and active in our lives. And you want the Holy Spirit to be moving in this place and moving in these guys' lives. So bless them, I pray, and speak to them tonight and help us to see what your word really says. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Okay, so first verse I wanted to go to is John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Just to show you some things about what the New Testament says about Jesus. Here it goes. In the beginning was the Word. That Greek word there is lagos. In the beginning was the lagos. And the lagos was with God. And the lagos was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that the lagos is said to be in the beginning with God, and to actually be God. Now, if you go a couple verses down in verse 14, you'll read this. And the Lagos became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. You see what happened there? So you have this idea, this Lagos. And it says that the Lagos was in the beginning with God and the Lagos was God. And then you fast forward and John says this about the Lagos, that the Lagos became flesh. So here's a huge proof text for the fact that Jesus is God. His follower, John the Apostle, calls him God right here. Because who became flesh to dwell among us? Jesus. That's right. He's talking about Jesus. He says, the Lagos. The Lagos became flesh. Who became flesh? Jesus became flesh. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Not only does that point to the fact that Jesus is God, but it points to the fact that there is a triune God, that there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now this can be kind of deep. A lot of people think I'm crazy. I've told you guys this before. When I tell people what I teach you guys, they're like, why do you teach middle schoolers and high schoolers these things? Because you guys can get it. Because I know that, that you can understand it. Because God has gifted you. You guys can think, you can engage your minds. And I expect a lot out of you guys. This is, this is why I'm telling you this. Some of you guys might be like, man, this is boring. Well, thank you for fueling the fire for the people that doubt you. Take a step back. If 
this is boring to you, ask yourself why this is boring. Rethink it and say, man, you know what? I have leaders here at 180 who expect a lot out of me, that expect me to get deep things and expect me to get off of my butt and serve, to get off of my butt and be loving like Jesus was. So a lot of people call me crazy, but I think you guys get it. So that's one of the proof texts right there. If you have pins or, or iPhones or anything like that, write this stuff down. John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. The next thing is this. In John chapter 8, really quickly, let's turn to John chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 48 through 59. This is an account of Jesus talking to the Pharisees. This is how it goes. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So they're accusing him of having a demon. And it says this, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. By the way, sometimes when you see that word, word in here, it's not lagos, it's rhema, which is the written word, okay? So I don't know what word this one is, but that's important for you guys to know, because you're like, whoa, it's talking about Jesus there. What's, it's, it's just, he's talking about his words, okay? And you can use context to figure out what the author is talking about in a lot of places. So it says this, in verse 52, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death? They're like, you're crazy. You do have a demon. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're talking like a crazy man, Jesus. And then Jesus, or this is what they say, surely Abraham who died and the prophets died too, whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered. So they said, Jesus, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, Mr. Big Is that what it is? Mr. what? Big stuff? Is that what it is? Oh, you... Say that's old school. That, uh, raise your hand if you're an old fart. Ooh, Lori. Okay, okay. Okay, so the Jews, okay, this is what happened. So this is what Jesus said. If I glory myself, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me and whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, and I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. So Jesus is like, I can't lie. I know God. I know my Father. If I tell you that I don't, I'm going to be just like you guys, a liar. So he calls him a liar there. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So he goes back to Abraham, who lived thousands of years before this encounter. Now, this is what they say to him. So the Jews said to him, you are not even 50 years old, Jesus. And have you seen Abraham? You're telling me that Abraham rejoiced to see your day? You're not even 50 years old. How could Abraham see your day? Jesus, you're crazy. This is what Jesus says. It's profound. And you're going to see what they do afterward. Watch this. This is what he says. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, think about the Jewish mind. If some of you guys have not been trained biblically, or biblically, haven't been to Sunday school, maybe you don't know this story, but think about Moses. Think about Moses before the burning bush. Tell me if if you hear anything similar to the words that Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, I am. Moses, before the burning bush, God says his name. He says what to call him. He says, I am that I am. Jesus says these words. Before Abraham was, I am. And it's not just that, but listen to this. In that time, in the first century, the Jewish leaders, the 
Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes, they all had a version of the Bible, the Old Testament. It was the Septuagint. It was written in Greek, just like the New Testament is written in Greek. And in that version, you see that whenever he says, I am that I am, the word translated is this in Greek. Are you ready? I've memorized it. You guys can memorize it too. It's ego, I me. Ego, like Lego, my ego. I and me. Lego, Lego, no, not Lego. Ego. Ego, I me. Ego, I me. So in their version of the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Pharisees knew very well. They knew what Jesus was saying at that moment. He was calling himself God. He said, I am. Now, what did they do afterward? Well, what do Jewish believers do if someone blasphemes God by calling themselves God? What? Stone him. Let's see if they do that. Verse 59. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. They knew what Jesus was saying. And Jesus knew what he was saying. They, they weren't just calling him crazy and then all of a sudden get mad for no reason just because he's a crazy man, but because they're like, whoa, they're all taken aback by this. They're like, did he just say that? They started picking up stones to throw at him. Jesus it says they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Proof text number two, that Jesus claimed to be God, that the New Testament claims that Jesus was God. Here's the next one, you ready? John chapter 20. I'm chilling in John for a little bit, I like John. John chapter 20, verse number 26 and 29. You know this story too, you've heard it. Have you guys heard of doubting? Thomas, Doubting Thomas. This is the story of Doubting Thomas. Here it goes. After eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. <laughs> then he said to Thomas, Thomas who doubted, and said to the disciples, the disciples were like, Man, Thomas, we saw Jesus. Man, it was crazy. And Thomas is like, Man, I don't believe you guys. Man, you guys are crazy. A lot of craziness going on in the Bible, by the way. People might call you crazy if you follow Jesus. But please let it be because you follow Jesus, not because you're crazy. Okay? So, a lot of that. So Thomas is like, man, I don't believe you guys, man. Unless I touch his hands where the holes went through, unless I see the, the, the stab in his side, then I'm not going to believe it. So this is what Jesus does to Thomas. He said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas is not, I promise you that he's not blaspheming right now. He's not saying, oh my God. That's not what he just did. Sorry. Okay, that's not what he did. He's saying, my Lord, you are my master and my God. Jesus, you rose from the dead. You are Lord and you are God. Thomas. Jesus said to him, this is just added on. I like this part. Because this, this speaks to us. Are you ready? Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. How many of you guys have ever seen Jesus? Oh, awkward. Awkward. Yeah, me neither. Guess what Jesus said about you guys who have believed in Jesus? Believe the testimony of the word. Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. <sighs> Blessed. That's you guys. Here's another place. Colossians chapter 1, written by Paul. This is fun. I'm gonna, by the way, I'm going to give you guys some, some scriptures to look at in small groups as well. 
Uh, but really quick, Colossians um, chapter 1. Oh, this is good stuff, man. This is good stuff. Chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. Here it goes. This is talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been, what? Created. Created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself would come to have first place in everything. So what are some things that we notice in that, in that scripture that, that Jesus was called? You can speak out. Anybody? The what? Firstborn. So he's the image of the invisible God. He is God. He's the image of God to us. It says that he is... Um, that all things have been created through him and for him. So he is what? The creator? Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? What's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 say? Anybody know it by heart? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who created the heavens and the earth? All things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things. The image of the invisible God, Jesus. One more before I go on to these three things, and we just talk about it just for a second. By the way, this is pretty cool stuff. A lot of people, man, I had a teacher, a science, a science teacher, and she, she one time asked me, uh, did, Jesus, did Jesus ever claim to be God? And, you know, I couldn't answer her in, in high school. And I never did. I never have still. I wonder if she is still a teacher. She's at North Forsyth, but well, I don't know. I've, I've never talked to her after that moment. But she was challenging my belief. And, uh, and I, so, I mean, that's whenever I really started to, to kind of study it, because she asked me the question. She said, did Jesus ever say it? She's like, I just never seen it. If Jesus, if I saw a place where Jesus said it, I would believe it. And I was like, Hmm. Well, now I have a couple of things. I, I, maybe I should go pay North Forsyth a visit one day and see. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> she wasn't my science teacher. She was a friend science teacher. So what, in, in high school, you know, after ninth grade, that's when I came to the Lord. Well, you know, I became kind of a, um, I guess like a, a figurehead almost. Not a figurehead, but like a pretty prominent Christian, I guess, like, Someone that, you know, went to, to like, we, we started prayer meetings and stuff like that. So we, had, we started having all the students coming around and praying in the courtyard before school. It was really awesome. We would have Bible study and we would pray. You know, and it got up to like 30 students meeting in the courtyard, uh, you know, and it's just like, it was amazing. God was doing awesome things, you know. And I'm like in the midst of it. And people are like, man, this guy's really serious, you know. And I, I was looked at as kind of like, you know, the Christian guy. I got like stories of like, any, I don't know. I was doing it for the girls mainly, but it's, it's whatever. Um, so they were like, hey, man, we got this teacher, you know. Hey, can you go, can you go talk to her? You know, she's pretty, you know, she's pretty smart, and, and she's asking us questions that we can't answer. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, let me go in there. So I went out and talked to her. <laughs> I went out, and I never talked to her again. And I was, I'm a chicken, to tell you the truth. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Revelation chapter 1. Here's another one. Um, by the way, it's okay to be scared to talk to people. I would say that as you talk to more people, the fear kind of goes away. But I remember being in your seat, having my beliefs challenged. Some things that, that, I, that I believe weren't really thought out very well, you know? Um, but that's what I'm hoping to do for you guys is is help you guys think these things out. So, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. 
Now, if I was Neil, by the way, man, I could tear anybody up in a conversation. Yeah. Like any debate. Because I would just look at them and yell at them. Don't mess with Neil, guys. He'll yell at you. Okay, verse 8, it says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. Oh, actually, this is God speaking. <laughs> but it's in red letters. I just laugh like Charlie. Oh, my gosh. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God. Did you hear that? You heard that, didn't you? It was like a giggle. See, that's it, yeah. Um, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay, and then in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, or verse 12 and 13, it says this. 12 and 13, it says this. This is Jesus. Behold, I am coming quickly. Who's coming quickly? Jesus is coming quickly. Just like he left the earth, he's coming back quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So Jesus here says that I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. Previously, God said what? I am the Alpha and Omega. By the way, if you're wondering what Alpha and Omega means, it's Greek. Really quick, the beginning word in the Greek alphabet is Alpha. The last word is Omega. It's our A and our Z. Alpha and Omega. Omega is really an O, by the way. Okay, so Alpha and Omega. So it says, I am the beginning and the end. That's what God said and that's what Jesus said. You can go to Old Testament and see that the same thing is said. In Isaiah 44, 6, God says the same thing about himself. And then Jesus says it. Guys, that's blasphemy if it's not true. But Jesus proclaims it. So get this. Jesus claimed to be God. That's what the New Testament says. You can see that in the prophecy fulfilled. You can see that in his sinless and miraculous life. And you can see it in his physical resurrection. Let's see if Chelsea got it right this time. 27 plus 16 equals 43. Good job. Okay. Number two is sinless and miraculous life. The third thing is his physical resurrection. So these are things that you can see. Not only does the word of God say it, but they were confirmed by three different things. Here it goes. Number one, prophecy fulfilled. Statistics of prophecy. Okay, uh, I gave Brendan a book. It's called The Case for Christ. And in it, uh, there's, a, there's a professor that speaks about the probability of Jesus fulfilling all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. He says this. For Jesus to have fulfilled eight prophecies in the Old Testament. By the way, if you want some, I got some right here. Prophecies, like he was born of a virgin, or that he was born from the house of David, or that he was born in Bethlehem, or that he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, sold for 30 pieces of silver. These are things I talked about last week as well. He would be pierced and wounded and bruised. For him to fulfill just eight prophecies in the Old Testament. By the way, there's over 200. For him to fulfill just eight, it's like this. If I blindfolded one of you guys and I covered the state of Texas in silver dollars two feet deep and I marked two of them. Actually, in the book it says one. I've heard Pastor David say two. So I'm going to just say one because that's still impossible, okay? For you to go into the state of Texas two feet deep and find that one on your first try, blindfolded. That's the probability of Jesus doing it. You know what they call that? Impossible. Impossible. And those are just some of the prophecies. That's only eight. A lot of people say different things to try to explain it. They say, well, Jesus was, you know, he was probably, you know, accidentally, you know, he just so happened to fulfill the prophecies. Well, that's impossible. Well, Jesus meant to fulfill the prophecies. Really? He meant to be born in Bethlehem? That, you, oh, really? He meant to be sold by 30 pieces, you know, for 30 pieces of silver? Like he had any control over that? Mm-hmm. So, all right. That's the first thing. So you can see that prophecies confirm that Jesus is who he says he was. 
Number two is this. His sinless and miraculous life. This is, my, this is one of my favorites. I taught you guys this one time. Mark chapter 2. Let's look at it real quick. I just like it. It's going to be hard for me not to try to teach it, but I'm, I'm going to try not to, okay? Forgive me. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. Man, this is good stuff. Okay, here it goes. Let me fast forward. Jesus is healing people like crazy. He's up in Galilee. Okay, people are bringing sick people to them all the time. You know, if you had a friend back in the day and you heard that there was a miracle worker and he was doing miraculous things, what would you do? Man, you would take your friend, you would pick them up and take them to Jesus. Well, one of the places where Jesus was was crowded. He was inside and some guys came up with their paralyzed friend on a bed and they're like looking through the crowd. They're trying to get Jesus, you know, to see this guy and like no one's letting him in and it's all pushing, you know, and they're like, how are we going to get him to Jesus? How are we going to get him to Jesus? Okay, so this is what they do. And they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men being unable to get him in because of the crowd they removed the roof above him and when they had dug an opening they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying so there it was they went to the roof they started digging it out and they dropped the paralytic down on jesus not like you know not abruptly like i mean i'm like sure they lowered him pretty soon you know, they didn't just like throw him hey jesus throw him heal him that would be funny ah oh, that's sick you are sick and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Sons, or son, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, this is important. Instead of healing the paralytic, what does Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you missed the point, man. Jesus, we didn't, we didn't lower him down so you could forgive his sins. We lowered him down so you could heal him. You're thinking, right? You're like, why did, he, why did he say that? Why didn't he just heal the guy? Well, Jesus tells us. Because the, the Pharisees are asking the same thing. The scribes are asking the same thing. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. The scribes are like, you know, the religious people who think they know everything. They're like, man, whatever, man. What is Jesus doing? He's, they, they said this. Why does this man speak that way? Why did Jesus just say that? What gives him the right? He is blaspheming. Who can, for, who can forgive sins but God alone? That's what they say. Did you hear that? The scribes are like, who does that dude think he is? He's not God. Forgiven sins? That's, that's not a man's job. That's God's job to forgive sins. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them this. And this is important. They rightly reasoned. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Jesus said this. Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Tell me which one's easier to say to this paralytic man. This man's paralyzed. Tell me, if you were in my shoes, what would you say to him? Would it be easier for you to say this? Your sins are forgiven? Think about this. If this were you in Jesus' shoes, say I gave you a paralytic man right now. First off, you'd be like, oh, I, don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Right? Listen. Would you say this? Your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up and walk? Pick up your pallet and walk. Which one's easier? Is it? Can you forgive his sins? Which, one's, which one is easier for you to do? Heal that guy or to forgive him of his sins? What? Neither. That's the point. Both of them are impossible for us to do. Did you get that? But Jesus, in order to tell them something else to teach them something else about himself, said to, the, said to him, your sins are forgiven. A.K.A., by the way, listen up, I'm God. I have the power to forgive sins. Son, your sins are forgiven. 
But then he said this, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he looked at the paralytic and he said this, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up immediately, picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Jesus showed by his miraculous life, healing of this paralyzed man, healing of the people that he healed before, raising people from the dead, that he was in fact God and that he had also the power to forgive sins. So Jesus miraculous, sinless life showed that he was God. And the third thing is his physical resurrection. I'll give you guys some homework. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It talks about the resurrection. Let me just read two more verses and we'll be finished. And I'll close it and you guys can do your small groups. It's like this. John chapter 10 verse 18 10, 18, it says this. Here it goes. No one has taken it away from me. Let me. Actually, let me go to 17, sorry. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. So Jesus says, I lay down my life. And then he says this in 18. No one has taken it away from me. He said, those guards, they're not going to take it away from me. The Jewish leaders, they're not going to take it away from me. My life is mine to give, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus had the authority, he said. I got the authority. Who has the authority to raise someone from the dead? Who? God. God has the authority to raise someone from the dead. Jesus just said, I have the authority to take up my life again. This commandment I received from my Father. And then these, these last verses. John chapter 2. Not that we need to go. Actually, we don't need to. John chapter 2, 19 and 22, if you're taking notes, if you want to write it down. Okay? Jesus showed that he was God. And it's confirmed by three things prophecy, the fulfillment of it, no one else could have in all of history. By his sinless, miraculous life, by the way, sinless, I didn't talk about sinless, but he never sinned, never did anything wrong, only did good. And number three, his physical resurrection showed that he is God. It's pretty convincing, right? Okay, so Jesus is God. That completes basically all of our premises for the apologetical argument for Christianity. I'm going to let you guys talk it through. I'm, they're going to have uh, other scriptures that you guys can go through. We'll split you guys up and you can go through it. We have about probably 10 minutes. So in your small groups, be sure to pray, talk, and leaders, you listen. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word that it's powerful, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And thank you that you're God and that you've chosen to speak through your word to us. Thank you that you haven't left us alone.